If you are somebody who used to perform a habit and you don't understand why you dropped it and you're frustrated with yourself and you're trying to figure out how you can get back into that habit, well, by all means, lean right back into that habit. But if you're having trouble doing that, also just use the procedural memory exercise in order to shift your nervous system toward a higher likelihood that you will return to that habit. It takes 21 days to form a habit. Some people say 18, some people say 21, some people say 30 days, some people say 60 days. So which one is it? Does it depend on the habit that one is trying to form or does it depend on the person that's trying to form the habit? For the same habit to be formed, it can take anywhere from 18 days to as many as 254 days for different individuals to form that habit. The reason I bring this up is that, is it true that it takes 21 days to form a habit? Is it true that your nervous system changes in six days when you're doing something repeatedly? And the answer is, it's highly variable. People are highly variable. And if you can't form one habit easily, it doesn't mean that you can't form other habits easily. The mystery of why certain people can form certain habits more easily than others probably has something to do with how well people manage what's called limbic friction is a shorthand way that I use to describe the strain that's required in order to overcome one of two states within your body. One state is one of anxiousness where you're really anxious and therefore you can't calm down, you can't relax and therefore you can't engage in some particular activity or thought pattern that you would like. The other state is one in which you're feeling too tired or lazy or not motivated. Both of those states, feeling too alert and too calm, if you will, relate to the function of the so-called autonomic nervous system. I'd like to give you a particular tool that's gleaned from the research psychology literature. It's very clear that for anyone trying to adopt new habits, getting into the mindset of procedural memory is very useful for overcoming that barrier that we call limbic friction. If you are deciding to adopt a new habit, to just think about the very specific sequence of steps that's required to execute that habit. Just one mental exercise of thinking through what are the sequence of steps required in order to perform this habit from start to finish can shift the likelihood of being able to perform that habit from unlikely or to moderately likely to very likely over time. And that's because it pulls from this process that involves our hippocampus and our neocortex and other areas of our brain and nervous system that engage in procedural memory. It shifts the brain towards a, a mindset, if you will. Uh, it's more of a neural circuit set of doing things in a particular sequence, which allows that limbic friction to come down and increases the likelihood that we're going to perform that thing. Simple tool, but very powerful tool according to the psychology literature. So now I'd like to discuss a second and what I think is perhaps the most powerful tool for being able to acquire and stick to new habits. This tool is rooted in what we call neural circuits, and I do think it is important to understand a little bit about how those neural circuits work. And the tool that I'm referring to is something called task bracketing, and the neural circuits associated with task bracketing are basically the neural circuits that are going to allow you to learn any new type of habit or break any habit that you'd like to break. You can orient your nervous system toward this tax bracketing process so that your nervous system is shifted or oriented towards the execution of a given habit. So this is sort of like warming up your body to exercise. When the dorsolateral striatum is engaged, your body and your brain are primed to execute a habit. And then you get to consciously insert which habit you want to perform. If you are somebody who used to perform a habit and you don't understand why you dropped it and you're frustrated with yourself and you're trying to figure out how you can get back into that habit, well, by all means, lean right back into that habit. But if you're having trouble doing that, also just use the procedural memory exercise in order to shift your nervous system toward a higher likelihood that you will return to that habit. So now I'm going to offer you a tool. It's actually an entire program by which you can insert particular habits and activities at particular phases of the day, not times of day, but phases of the day, because it turns out that particular phases of the day are associated with particular biological underpinnings, chemicals and neural circuits and so forth. And in doing so, it will make it far more likely that you'll be able to regularly engage in these habits and activities over a long period of time. Phase one, which is zero to eight hours after waking, has a particular neurochemical signature. The neuromodulators tend to be elevated during that first zero to eight hours after waking. Viewing sunlight or 
bright artificial light if you can't access sunlight within the first 30 minutes of waking, physical exercise of some kind, cold exposure in the form of cold showers or ice baths or outside uh, with minimal uh, clothing, um, appropriate yet minimal clothing, caffeine ingestion, uh, fasting, for instance, all of those things further facilitate the neurochemistry and therefore the state of mind that's going to be ideal for leaning into limbic friction and overriding that limbic friction so that you can regularly perform that habit. What we're really talking about here is leveraging neural systems in order to help you make it more likely that you're going to be able to engage and maintain a particular habit. Phase two, as I mentioned, is about, again, nine to 14 or 15 hours after waking. During this phase of the day, because of the circadian shifts in our biology, the amount of dopamine and norepinephrine that's circulating in our brain and bloodstream tends to start to come down and levels of cortisol tend to start to come down. That's the ideal circumstance. In fact, you don't really want elevated cortisol late in the day. That's actually a signature of depression and anxiety and a number of other uh, unfortunate things. So nine to 14 hours after waking, a different neuromodulator, serotonin, is starting to rise. Serotonin is definitely going to be highest in this second half of the day and tends to lend itself to a more relaxed state of being. For those of you that can only exercise or prefer to exercise in phase two of the day, right, nine to 14 hours or 15 hours after waking, that's absolutely fine. If you do train in phase two, I highly recommend, highly recommend that you start doing some sort of NSDR type activity after you train within an hour or two, because that will allow you to taper down and relax so that you can get into the next phase we're going to talk about, which is phase three. Phase three of the 24 hour schedule runs from about 16 to 24 hours after waking. During that period of time, there are a few things that are going to support being in a state of mind state of body that are going to allow neuroplasticity to occur, that are going to allow the rewiring that you've triggered during the waking part of the day to actually take place. Those things are very low to no light, meaning keeping your environment very dark or very, very dim. I don't think it's necessary to sleep in a room that's complete blackness. I think that's a little bit overkill, but for most people keeping the room dark and keeping the room temperature low is very beneficial for getting and staying in deep sleep. The body has to drop by about one to three degrees in order to get into sleep and to stay asleep. 